Major support for these broadcasts is provided by Bank of America Merrill Lynch and Perfect Building Maintenance, New York Community Bank, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company, Greenberg Traurig, LLP, MNT Bank. Additional support is provided by AVR Realty Company, LLC, All Nation Renovation, Bingham McCutcheon, LLP, Briarwood Organization, Bruce Mosler, Capital One Bank, Cassidy Turley, C.B. Richard Ellis, James Orfanides, Centurion Holdings, Chelsea Lighting, Cushman and Wakefield, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Douglaston Development, DDG Partners, Hal Fetner, Durst Fetner Residential, Friedman LLP, Accountants and Advisors, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, LLC, Genova, Burns and Gian Tomasi, Investors Bank, Jack Jaffa and Associates, Real Estate Consultants, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Center at Syracuse University, Corman Communities, Madison Realty Capital, Margolin Weiner and Evans LLP, Certified Public Accountants and Business Advisors, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Meridian Capital Group, Newmark Knight Frank, Site Comply, Sterling & Sterling, SJP Properties, Stonehenge Partners, The Wickoff Group, Urban American, Ackman Ziff Real Estate, Eastern Consolidated, Goldman Properties, The Moynian Group, Muss Development, RAL Development Services, The Spandrel Group, LLC, Triangle Equities. So you get a kid who grows up in the Bronx, who grows in, uh, in a rent-controlled apartment, who becomes one of the most prominent and successful owners of apartments and other office buildings in New York. There aren't too many stories like that, but I have today the chairman and the CEO of Stella Management, Larry Gluck, today. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. So I was saying to you that you were born in Bronx, Lebanon Hospital, and you said to me that your mother and father lived across the street from the building where you were born. That's true. So tell me about that. And, and they met in that building, right? Uh, my mother and her family lived on the first floor. My father and his family lived on the second floor, 1726 Andrews Avenue. And uh, they got married at 19 and 17 and moved across the street to 1741 Andrews Avenue. Now, but what you told me which was interesting, your, your dad, who was in the food service, which we'll talk about in a little while, was able to scrape up some money, and he, he, he made the deal to get this apartment? What happened? Well, well it is true. Um, my dad, in 1947, when they got married, and um, had to move across the street, they paid, my dad told me, many decades later, they paid off the superintendent, I don't remember, it was an enormous amount of money, $1,500, something big like that for then, to, uh, to get that rent control department, yes. And that's where you live growing up? That's true. With your, do you have a brother? I have uh, two brothers and a sister. So you all lived in this apartment, in this rent control department? So the six of us and a dog lived in our two bedroom Rent, one bath, rent control department on the third floor, yes. And during that time, you, your dad, who had an interesting life, he worked uh, in the food service business at Burnside Manor, right? Which was a catering hall? Um, he, he did for a time. Actually, my parents were also married at the Burnside Manor. And yes, my dad was in the food services business, and yes, he... And, and then subsequently, he opened up later on in the garment center, a place he did. He opened a restaurant for a period of time on uh, 36th Street between 7th and 8th, uh, between, between 5th and 6th. Um, Bonnie's was the name of the restaurant, and that was his, 
his business. Right. So let's talk a little bit about Larry. So, so Larry is growing up in, in the Bronx, and you know, during the summer, you know, you're working, but you had one of those jobs in the Catskills. What, what did you do in the Catskills? You know, as a back then, uh, when a young man wanted to make money, you would drive up to Sullivan County, what you call the Catskills, a few weeks before Passover, and um, go from hotel to hotel and uh, see if you could find employment as a waiter. And, uh, and I did do that. And Paramount uh, Hotel? Well, actually, the Paramount Hotel job I got much younger through my dad, who worked there. And at 16, I was a waiter uh, in the children's dining room. By the next year, 17, I graduated to the main dining room. And I was making a fortune of money for the time. Which you subsequently used to buy yourself a VW, right? A fortune of money being $300 cash um, a week, more or less. And yes, I did use that money to buy a, a 1968 Volkswagen Beetle. Which mom, who worked in the uh, for the Chrysler dealer was able to help you. I have no secrets now, yes. My and, mom and especially since the show is going to be down there, so in Plantation, for all the friends, they'll be able to tell this story. Terrific. Yes, my mom was a bookkeeper in the Chrysler dealership in Forest Hills, Rego Park at the time, and, uh, and she found me the 1968 53 horsepower Volkswagen Beetle, which I bought. So now what happens is you graduate DeWitt Clinton? I did graduate... Uh, well, I attended DeWitt Clinton, and, and then in 1969, uh, 60, 68, I believe, things were getting uh, a little bit uh, dicey where we lived in the Bronx and in DeWitt Clinton. Remember 1968, uh, Martin Luther King was murdered, and Bobby Kennedy was murdered, and DeWitt Clinton was an all boys school and there was no social graduation back then. There were a lot of um, angry uh, young men in the school at that time and I say men because although I was maybe 15 or 16, 16 let's say, there were men who were 20 years old who were students um, in that school who were very large and very angry and it was a difficult Let, time. Let's get to the life. Okay, so the dad goes to Queens, to the Regal Park section of Queens, mom and dad, and they buy a house. And you were telling me that your, 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 your mother's father had one of the original medallions, and he uh, lent them money. Well, we had to move to Queens because Bronx was getting very difficult in 1968. My dad selected Regal Park because it was near the subway he can get to work. And the house was thirty-two thousand five hundred dollars, and he didn't have that kind of money. He, he, as I recall, got a loan from uh, his father-in-law, my maternal grandfather, for I believe ten thousand um, dollars. The reason my maternal grandfather had that kind of money is he was a, a saver, but he was also a, an original purchaser of uh, an original issue medallion from the city of New York in the, I guess, the early 30s, $10 for medallion, $40 for a taxi, and you're off to the races. So now let's talk about Larry getting off to the races. So you're in Queens, you enter Queens College, part of the City University, one of the best uh, colleges, and you know, as we joked, your father paid the fee because it was $53, he paid the bursa fee. But you, you say to your dad that, you know, hey dad, I want to, I want to open up a pharmacy. What, what was this well, with a pharmacy? You know, uh, my dad was proud of the fact, uh, the inside joke being that he paid for college for me, uh, laughing kind of that, you know, that meant bursar's fees back then, which is $53 a term. Let's get to the pharmacy. Now, then my dad asked me, what do you want to do? And I just responded kind of without a lot of thought that I wanted to be a pharmacist. Why did you want to be a pharmacist, my dad asked. I wanted to be a pharmacist, I said, so I could open a drugstore and make money in this. And he turned to me uh, and said, well, why don't you just 
open a drugstore and hire a pharmacist. And, and n th repeating the story now, it's kind of an obvious statement. But back then, when you're a young Jewish kid and you're kind of schooled to think that um, you know, uh, uh, a, a, a profession, a trade, uh, is, is, is a way to go, it was a little bit of an eye op opener for me, and I, I took it to heart. You're going to college. Did you drive your grandfather's taxi? Because no, you said you, I, you, had, you were driving a checker. A, a, actually, it's, it's true. While I was in college, I drove uh, a yellow cab, not, not my grandfather's, but I drove a yellow cab three nights a week to, uh, well, to earn money. So now you graduate college, and how did you decide to go to St. John's Law School? I graduated college with basically no skills. Uh, I decided, tallying up my credits, that I had the most in psychology, so poof, I became a psychology major. But I had no skills and no work prospects, so I took the, um, the LSATs, the LSATs, and I scored well, uh, viewing, viewing law school as you know, a combination of a trade school and kind of a, a profession that would you know, give me some kind of uh, ability to earn money. So when you're in law school, uh, you know, there are different areas. You graduate law school, and then you decide to, uh, your first job after law school is where? My first job after law school was at a firm on 6th Avenue called Condon and Forsyth, which was a high-end kind of a uh, niche player in, in what was called aviation litigation. It wasn't my, my area of interest, but on the other hand, I needed a job. After being there less than a year, I was called up pursuant to a waiting list uh, to work at the Appellate Division Second Judicial Department. Which in Brooklyn. Was in, in Brooklyn Heights, which was a prestigious clerkship. Um, I worked there for two years. And from there, I got a job at Proskow Rose Getz and Mendelssohn. And at Proskow Rose, you, you go over there in the litigation department because... Well, that's the natural segue from being in the court system. But litigation was not something that you really wanted to do, right? It, it, it was not. Uh, it was, um, I felt, uh, too stressful, too, too destructive, just didn't fit my personality to, uh, to serve papers on somebody on a Friday or have them served on me on a Friday to ruin your weekend to be ready on Monday. So now you have a good job. Prescott is a great firm, you know, and, how, and I think you said to me it was the day of maybe that John Lennon was shot. Uh, you get an opportunity to get a, an interview or a job with one of the best real estate law firms in the city at that time, Dreyer and Trout. Have, having decided that, and having known all along actually, that commercial litigation was not for me, and having developed a love of architecture by living uh, in Brooklyn Heights, which is still a beautiful landmarked area, I, I, I wanted to get a job in real estate law. I thought it would be a nice segue into business, and a more stable area of the law. I interviewed uh, with Dreyer and Traub. It's a day I can't forget because it was John Lennon was killed on a Monday, I interviewed on Tuesday, and I got the job approximately one month later. And the, the interesting situation is that you took a, a major financial cut to go there because you really wanted to be practicing uh, real estate law. I did take, a, take what was characterized to me by the senior partner as a major financial cut, which impressed him and I think put him over the edge in hiring me, in addition to having the fancy credentials of coming from Proscara Rose um, to Dryer and Traub, which in fairness, although I loved that firm, was uh, a cut below, uh, at least in the public uh, 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 arena. Uh, I did take a, a massive pay cut from fifty to thirty-five thousand dollars a year. Now, when you're there, I mean, Dreyer and Traub was New York City real estate. I mean, it, you you, it, it, you you met these it, players it, and everyone. Honestly, in retrospect, uh, I should have paid them to be there. It was the laboratory. I met. 
Donald Trump and Peter Calico and Donald Zucker and all the luminaries of the day, and it was a terrific training ground. So what happens one day? You're living in Brooklyn Heights, and you say, look, I got this job. I really want to own something. So what's that first building that you buy? How do you find it, and how do you, how do you buy it even? Well, uh, back then, uh, a more primitive time, listings were placed in uh, the New York Times classified to find real estate. And uh, I found a piece of real estate uh, near my house in, in Brooklyn Heights, Carroll Gardens is the area, called 540 Henry Street. And I made the purchase uh, by passing the hat amongst my brother and one or two law school friends. And I bought a building for $192,000 and financed, we'll call it 80% of it. It worked mathematically, and um, it was, that was on, my the, first was on the road. And then the, the, build, the second one was on Sackett Street, right? The second one, the, the first one, 540 Henry, was just one block from the Camarary Bakery, which was made famous in Moon's Moon Drug, to give you some context. 192 Sackett was a little further south, also a very nice area. Which I, um, which I bought on my own, and interestingly, uh, my current wife, Sandy, accompanied me uh, to meet this lovely old Italian family who were as concerned about who they were selling to as their purchase price. So Sandy and I went. Sandy um, borrowed my sister-in-law's wedding band and wedding ring, so we looked like a proper married couple, and we all got on very well and ended up buying that property. Then, you know, you, you're over there and you're, you're working at Dry and Traub. you got these two buildings. A buddy of yours by the name of Mitch Lobart? Mitch Lobart, um, who I think went on to Squadron Elenoff at the time, introduced me to a, an associate at the firm. I was a junior partner. He introduced me to, and he said, please meet this guy, Steve Whitkoff. He kind of does what you do or wants to do what you do. And great, thanks, Mitch. And Stephen and I got on well on a personal level. And what happens? You, 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 get, uh, you go to up to Inwood, right? And you find the building. Where? Uh, we did. Um, we started looking at product. Um, and we found a piece, 915 Post Avenue in Inwood. Um, we, we, we scheduled to sit down at a contract. We sat down on a Monday. We got a little nervous. Too many people on uh, uh, social services there for us, or f for what we thought would be appropriate. Came back a week later; it was still available. We bought it, but long story short is, we we flipped that contract. We we barely had enough money for the down payment; it was about ten thousand. We flipped that contract for two hundred and thirty thousand dollars. One hundred and fifteen thousand apiece. Not bad. Exactly, which of course eclipsed my salary as a young partner at Dreyer and Traub, and I, it, was, it was a shock. And you knew it was time to go into business. So now, if I'm, my calculation is correct, you're about 33, and Steve is maybe 30. There's a couple years difference. And I, I think he's, he may be five years younger than me. Okay, maybe he's 28. And you create Stellar, Steve and Larry Management. And you start buying buildings, and you know, there have been a number of notable buildings, but one of them is where you really have an office today, your, your main headquarters, which has a great story because it relates to Independence Plaza. So one of the first office buildings that you bought was? 156 William Street, um, which we bought. Uh, when we bought it in the early 90s, downtown was a wasteland. Um, we bought it from the Bank of Nova Scotia, for less per foot than you could rent there at now. We bought it for probably uh, 20, low 20s a foot. The entire building, which has grown over the years, uh, is approximately 200, 220,000 feet. And um, we paid five and a half million dollars for it, could only finance 50% of that amount, and uh, moved our offices in there, and I'm currently there. Um, but yes, that was our first and, commercial and purchase. Right, but one of your really main commercial purchases, because we're going to talk about some of your main residential, because you have so many residential properties, 
was when you bought the Daily News building. Tell me about that. When we bought the Daily News building in the early 90s, we paid $100 a foot, which was um, a fairly- five, five, five times more than you paid for it, it was a fairly, worth. it sounds silly now, but at $100 a foot, it was uh, a million square feet, so it's $100 million. It was a fairly astonishing amount of money. It was a uh, publicly vetted sale through Jones Lang, I think. Um, so no secrets here, but we paid the number. And um, it, was, it was an era where I wouldn't say we were the first to do this, but we certainly um, were, were the first that we knew to come in and really aggressively attack the expense side of the ledger. And, um, and we did that. And it was also a time before uh, Mr. Giuliani had, had um, kind of cracked the carding cartel for commercial properties. And by way of example, we took the rubbish removal cost from $27,000 a month to de minimis, which was. Now, all during this time, you were continually buying residential properties in the boroughs uh, and so on. But one of the major properties, which today is called Columbus Square, is that you bought from the Hemsleys, Park West Village. I did. Tell me about that. Um, I bought the site directly from Mrs. Helmsley for, I believe, $122 million. The, the entirety of Park West Village uh, net of the buildings that he had condoed, but inclusive of the 550-ish unsold condo units that were there. And Park West Village is what, on Columbus and Amsterdam? It is, um, the bl it is between 97th and 100th. Um, Columbus and Amsterdam, but the eastern portion um, from Columbus to Central Park West were four buildings that Mr. Helmsley had condoed, and there were remaining about 550 unsold apartments. So we got those 550 unsold apartments, three large apartment houses to the east of Columbus Avenue, as well as all this land that we ultimately ended up building on, but, but was at the time subject mm -hmm to a restrictive covenant prohibiting easement, so uh, prohibiting construction. So let's talk about that because Columbus Square today is, is such a, it's so important for the city and, and the community because the far west, it's not the far west side, that portion of the west side really had not had urban retail and urban retail was really needed. And you got there, uh, you have right now a Whole Foods, yes. a Barnes and Nobles, uh, a, a Marshalls, a Home Goods, I mean, my wife is very happy she can go up there. But you, you have that, and then in addition to the retail, and then you have an associate, and I think you have a school um, uh, for kids over there, you also built a couple of apartment buildings. What We built 500,000 square feet of retail, uh, commercial and retail, and five, uh, uh, in the base of five apartment houses, 808 Columbus, which is um, the entire block front from 97th to 100th Street. There are no intervening blocks there. In, the, um, in what's known as the, um, the Slum Clearance Act of 1959, the city of New York condemned the intervening streets and gave that entire piece of land to Alcoa uh, to develop, and they did develop it. And we took over, actually, that's the basis, the historical basis for um, the whole Columbus Square. So 808 Columbus, so there are no intervening blocks. 808 Columbus goes from 97th to 100th Street on the west side of the street. On the east side of the street, we have three apartment houses, 775, 795, and 805 Columbus. And then there's one out parcel at 100th and um, Amsterdam called 801 Amsterdam. That aggregation of buildings is what we call Columbus Square. Let's talk about Independence Plaza. Major property which you bought for the same price of the building that you own, right? Well, to, to st <laughs> I, I, when pricing Independence Plaza, it, it, it really, it, it's interesting, but it's absolutely accurate uh, that we, pr we priced the deal at $156 million, 
for no reason other than we're at 156 Williams. How big is Independence Plaza? Um, 1.3 million square feet. And how many apartments in retail? 1,328 uh, apartments. And um, I don't know, the retail is maybe 70,000 feet. And, and over the last couple of years, you, you've been doing a lot of uh, maintaining of affordable apartments. I think you did one, the city was very happy that you did uh, in Brooklyn last year. Tell me about that. We did an affordable housing t deal called Tivoli Towers in Crown Heights, Brooklyn. We're renovating the entire building, the entire base building, as well as new kitchens, new baths uh, in every uh, apartment. There are approximately 350 apartments there. Let's talk about family. Uh, you have how many kids? I have three daughters. And their name? Their names are Amanda, who is 22, Dana, who is 19, and Heather, who is 13. Do you think the kids will go into the business? I hope so, but I wouldn't bet on it. Why? They have their own lives to live. And, and what else are you doing uh, today? Um, what, uh, what are the additional properties? I mean, you... Expansion-wise, you, you you own two Rector Street. I do. And over the years, what you you bought buildings on Lexington Avenue and so on. Well, I've bought. I owned for a period of five seventy Lex. Bought and sold that. Um, I owned one Broadway. Bought and sold that. Um, currently, we're developing um, a large apartment house at Ninety Second and West End Avenue. Is that six six six? Yes, it is. And then a couple of years ago, I believe you did it with Brad Capital and so on, you took the Alcott Hotel? We did, 27 West 72nd Street, which was a residential hotel. And we made that into a, uh, I believe, very successful uh, condominium. And you, you, you've also, um, you, have a, you have a number of buildings up in the Bronx and in Manhattan? I do. What are you doing with those buildings? Those are rental properties. We just main, we maintain them as rental properties. And what about Embassy? You bought that a number of years ago also from the Hemsleys. I did buy that from the Hemsleys. Embassy House is the block front on 2nd Avenue between 47th and 48th. And we're maintaining that and developing that as a fully monetized apartment house. So, you know, like the kid from the Bronx, did, you know, did you ever think you'd be... Um, in a, a real estate baron, as somebody would say? <laughs> I don't know if I'm a baron, but uh, I've had a lot of good luck in my life. And, and, I, and I think, you know, I think it's, it's the roots of learning, growing up in the community, giving back to the community, and working hard really does it. And I'd like to thank you for being here today. Thank you for having me.